In this week of the module Human Behavior and Sustainable Development, we are exploring the big concept of cooperation, which is a behavioral concept, and we're exploring what is its role in sustainability. Here are some general core concepts that all we will also explore in this unit. So cooperation, but also conflict, the idea of social dilemma, fairness, and autonomy. The themes that we will be exploring relate to some of the competencies that we want to develop in students, such as cooperation competency and evaluation competency. And we will be exploring some big questions such as, can we consider humans as a cooperative species? And what is the role of cooperation in sustainable development? And what are some conditions and behaviors that allow humans to overcome social dilemmas and cooperate towards shared goals? At the end, your group assignment will be to use the concepts of this class to reflect on how you can best work together in your own project group. To start off, let's do a little excursion by looking at a set kind of behavioral experiment that was conducted at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology here in Leipzig, Germany. And the experiments try to answer the questions, how do six-year-old children on the one hand, and how do chimpanzees behave when they have to share a resource with a partner? So what I, I will explain the experimental setup to you, and then we want to find out what do you think, what will be the outcomes of the experiments. So the experiment looked like this. This is the experimental apparatus for children. One child would be sitting on one side of the apparatus and the other child on the other side. And the apparatus uh, worked like this. Here at the top was a bucket with blue magic water in it. So the children were told this is blue magic water. And it was dripping just with a, little, with a very small flow into this cylinder in the middle. So it's kind of like uh, the resource was regrowing here, being refilled in the cylinder in the middle. And this, of course, led to the water in the cylinder going up, and this was shown by a red cork. And now on each side, each child had a tab that they could open to collect some of the resource into their individual tubes here. And they could then float up these eggs, and the more of these yellow eggs that they collected, they could then at the end exchange it for candy. So of course the children were interested to collect individually as much water as possible into their own tubes. But the problem is, of course, once you open these tabs, then the water here will sink in, in the middle cylinder. And the challenge is that the cork can sink under this threshold, under which the resource kind of collapses, and then nothing is available anymore for anybody. So it basically led to some mechanism that made it, that led to the water flowing out of the central cylinder, and so then the experiment would be over over it, no more water could be collected for anybody. So the challenge was, of course, to collect as much water as possible, but at the same time also prevent uh, the cork from reaching this threshold. For the chimpanzees, the setup was very similar, only that instead of blue magic water, which the chimps, of course, wouldn't understand, they directly had as a resource sweet mango juice, which they like a lot. And instead of opening tabs, they could directly drink this juice from these drinking nipples. But otherwise, um, the whole setup was really the same. They could see how the resource was in the cylinder, and also they had to make sure that the cork doesn't reach this threshold because, because then the whole resource would collapse and would not be available anymore. Now, importantly, all the chimpanzees and children that took part in this experiment first learned individually before the experiment. They learned how to use this apparatus in such a way that they can take from the resource for as long as possible, but without collapsing it. For example, in this situation here, the child really has just learned, oh, if I take too much at once, the cork will sink too low and then I can't have any more. So I better wait for a little while until there is more in the cylinder for me to take. 
and the chimpanzees, similarly, they learned to kind of regulate their behavior, be a little bit more patient so that the cork wouldn't sink too low. And the question now is, what happens if they are now put in a situation with a partner? Which, so basically, they have to now see what the other partner does. They have to kind of find a way to cooperate to so that they together would be keeping um, the cork above the threshold. And so we want to know from you, what do you think? Which species will be more successful in cooperating in this experiment, the human children or the chimpanzees? And especially explain why do you think so? What kind of behaviors do you expect from the children? And what kind of behaviors do you expect from the chimpanzees in this kind of situation? So in a classroom context, we can be collecting some of the answers that you um, came up with, whether you think children will do better and why, or chimpanzees will do better and why. Let's just look at the results. In fact, it wasn't very easy for the children. They were successful in about 25% of the trials. And successful children, they tended to talk more, they made rules, they shared more fairly, and they also learned to become a little better over time because they understood how to, how to cooperate, how to do it. On the other hand, the chimpanzees, well, they were only successful in about 13% of the trials. And the successful pairs, in fact, they solved it through dominance relationships, such that the more dominant was like taking more uh, and the other one got less. And so they also had less equal sharing and they were also less successful over time because more and more competition um, took over. So interestingly, in fact, it looks like here in this experiment, children were actually more successful. Um, but when we ask students and also teachers to make their predictions about the experiment, we find that there's really overall a, quite a trend that most people really think that chimpanzees would be more successful in, in this experiment. And that is quite an interesting, even like a shocking result the kind of qualitative explanations that we get are things like humans are just greedy animals, so they can't really cooperate, especially children. They just think about themselves and they will compete. They just will think about their own sweets. Children also don't learn that resources are limited. They just get everything they want and things like humans are just selfish. On the other hand, the thinking about chimpanzees often entails things like the chimpanzees have to share in nature. Chimpanzees live in groups and they know they can only survive together. The chimpanzees depend on the resources in nature so they know how to save and use them sustainably. Well, these are re results are really interesting and shocking because from the perspective of evolutionary anthropology and behavioral science, we actually find rather that our species is highly cooperative and that also compared to other primate species. When we're looking at our everyday experience and just society, we were actually finding so many examples uh, where our everyday life just depends on many people being able to cooperate and, and to live together. And so one big question is in, in research, why and how do humans actually cooperate? Yeah, we're sending fellow humans into space and having huge governments. All of this is not something we find any other primate species or even any other species do. And so it's interesting to think about then why do most students and teachers seem to think this way, having this picture of humans as just selfish, especially compared to other species such as chimpanzees. Maybe think about this question for a little bit or even depending on how what your predictions were in the experiment, what might have influenced your views on, on humans compared to other animals. Here are just some ideas that we've had to understand this kind of phenomenon. Um, maybe it's the case that everyday cooperation is kind of invisible and so therefore we take it for granted and we don't consider it something that is that needs an explanation, that is something that is peculiar and that we need to understand and explain. It's just something that we don't even see. Instead, on the other hand, what might be what we see is negative human traits, especially when they are emphasized in, in the media, conflict, violence, corruption. These are all negative things that we much more might be aware of uh, happening in society, but the everyday stuff 
the everyday interactions that really hold society together, which really are much more prevalent, they might, on the other hand, be invisible. Another thing is about how we think about all these various sustainable development challenges that we are facing in today's world. And so people might think it must be because there's something wrong with our human nature uh, compared to the nature of other species. But really, it's a little bit more uh, complicated than that. We also find, for example, that chimpanzees have been found to overhunt uh, certain species um, uh, and so on. So it's not not so simple that there's something about our nature that makes us less co less sustainable. Then there might be also something when we're looking at the curricula or textbooks of certain subjects, maybe um, certain traits such as selfishness or individual traits might be more emphasized, such as in, as in economics or in biology. To what degree is human cooperation really the focus of instruction? And finally, there might be something that we like that we have called expectation bias. Maybe students and teachers they expect that when we present experiments like this, that really we want the, them to understand that humans are really bad and and that other animals actually are better than us in in many ways. And so um, they might expect that really we want to show that chimpanzees are more cooperative than humans. But of course, we can then ask why does this expectation bias exist? And so overall. Well, why might this be important? Why might it be a problem if most humans think this way? Think about this question uh, for a moment. Why might we want to be concerned with how humans really think about other humans, about our species, about what makes us human? And why might this really be important even especially for education for sustainable development and for addressing sustainable development problems? Well, one answer you might come up with is that it really matters for how we view ourselves, our fellow humans, and how we react in situations, uh, the way that we expect humans to behave. In fact, studies show that um, students who, are, who have been trained in kind of a view of human behavior, that humans are mostly selfish and interested only in, the, in their own benefits, that those students who learn this, in fact, do behave less cooperatively in, in experiments. So really, our views on human nature really affect our behaviors. And so this is really something that should interest us as teachers. That we help students develop mental models about human behavior that are actually, first of all, in line with the science, but then also actually helpful. Here are just some other ways that you might spark and start off a conversation or just a thinking about what actually makes us human um, with students. For example, if we look at a graph of population growth of our species compared to the number of species of other apes other than humans that are alive today. So we have almost 8 billion humans today compared to about half a million apes. And so it's like, we are very related to each other, but yet we find this stark difference in our population numbers. And to just think about what kinds of human traits really made this actually possible. Or another fun way to contemplate is the idea of the planet of the apes. Why on the one hand is it fiction when it's about the four species of apes, chimpanzee, gorilla, orangutan, and why is this reality when it comes to our species of, of ape, right? We are also one of the four species of apes. Why is it a reality when it comes to our species, but fiction when it comes to the other three species? Especially when we're considering then that, for example, chimpanzees and humans share about 99% of their DNA. What is the difference? Mm -hmm.